This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. With worrying economic growth prospects and substantial financial support for Ukraine, Europe is currently undergoing some hard times, which also includes a continuing energy crisis and high inflation. So what is the way out? How should Europe proceed with a policy of de-risking from China under such conditions? And what is the future development of the Belt and Road Initiative? To find out more, I'm glad to have this exclusive interview with Yanis Varoufakis, former Greek Minister of Finance. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue, Yanis. Uh, first, let's start with uh, the European economy. Uh, we know that uh, the economic growth for 2023 has been uh, slashed from 1% to 0.8%. Similarly, uh, the GDP of the Eurozone is also slashed from 1.1% to 0.8%. Uh, so are you surprised this, uh, with this reduced growth uh, expectation? No, I'm not surprised. Um, I was expecting even worse. But these numbers uh, don't tell the story. The real story um, can only be gleaned at when you look at what has been happening since 2008. In 2008, uh, total income for the European Union, including Britain back then, exceeded by more than 11% that of the United States. Today, the United States total income, GDP, exceeds that of the European Union, including Britain, by 25%. Similarly, a comparison with China reveals that the European Union and the Eurozone in particular is falling fast behind. And that has to do with the way we dealt with the 2008 Western North Atlantic financial collapse. It was the worst management of that crisis in the world, what we saw here in the European Union, and we're still paying the price for it. We've had 13, 14 years of almost negative investment. Uh, unlike in the United States, are like in China. So this is the real cause of concern, the deindustrialization and falling behind of Europe as a result of a combination of uh, harsh austerity for the majority of the peoples of Europe and what I call socialism for the bankers only, uh, the bailouts of the banks, and, the, and particularly the way that it was done in the European Union. Okay, okay long-term factors. So what about the, this uh, you know, near-term factors? For example, uh, probably high energy uh, prices and, of course, the Ukraine crisis, which is still going on, and we don't know when it will end? Well, it didn't help, did it? Uh, the uh, steam engine of the Eurozone economy has always been Germany. And not just the Eurozone economy. Countries like uh, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, Poland have been pulled along for a long time now by the industrial miracle of the Federal Republic of Germany. That model was based on three pillars, cheap Russian gas, suppressed wages for German way, uh, workers, uh, and uh, vast Chinese market for the products of the Mittelstand, that is uh, manufacturing products that your economy was consuming in the process of your modernization. All three pillars are very shaky. Cheap energy from, from Russia has been disrupted completely because of the war in Ukraine. Inflation has created uh, inflationary forces in the labor market. And the new Cold War, persecuted by Washington for some time now, is creating serious impediments to Germany's capacity, political capacity to a very large extent, to export to China. Mm, in, of course, in addition to the Europeans you know, being affected by the Ukraine crisis, uh, you, know, you do see globally there is an impact. Uh, for example, you know, the, uh, basically China, India and the, largely the global south basically are not really with the West, with the US or Europeans in terms of uh, how to deal with uh, this crisis and how to deal with Russia. Uh, so let's see that kind of impact is far reaching. 
beyond the European borders? Well, absolutely. The, uh, Europe and the United States have been uh, absolutely isolated from the rest of the world. What really matters now, what ethics, rationality, economics, and common basic humanity dictate at this moment is to end this war in a manner that allows Russian troops or forces Russian troops to withdraw to where they were in February 2022 and for the world to move on and start healing our wounds, our collective wounds from this disgusting war. So, you know, uh, you, know uh, you once said that uh, there's um, a European economic crisis and then there's a fun, uh, you know, foregone closure of the European collapse, uh, let's say, uh, the collapse of the European economy. And of course, the German model over there. Uh, basically, you are getting firmer in your view now? I never use the word collapse. I'm, I've been very, very careful. I don't believe that the European Union economy is collapsing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's worse. In a sense, it's worse. What I have been saying is there is a steady, steady decline, like a very bad disease, a malaise. We don't have a crisis, we have a malaise. We have underinvestment. Uh, as you very well know, I don't need to lecture you on this. If an, an advanced economy spends 13, 14 years with very low levels of investment, we had the highest level of savings and liquidity, money, sloshing around the financial sector in the European Union uh, since the beginning of time. Lots of money, but very low investment in productive capacity. Uh, we did not invest in the technologies of the future. Uh, green energy, almost zero investment, net investment. Artificial intelligence, cloud capital. These are the technological advantages of the future. And Europe has, uh, instead of investing in all this, it has been imposing strict austerity on itself. And the result was that European capital fled Europe and invested itself elsewhere, including in China. So this is, you know, it's not collapse. As I said, it's worse because if you have a collapse, you have a crisis, you can react to it. But if you have a steady decline, which is imperceptible because Europe is still very rich and will remain rich for very, very, a very long time. But nevertheless, it is declining. It is deindustrializing. You can see when it comes to battery technologies, we cannot compete with China or with the United States when it comes to big tech. America has its own big tech, what I call cloud capital in Silicon Valley. China has its own big tech. Europe has no big tech. So essentially, all the um, competitive advantages that Europe used to have are being wasted. They are evaporating on a daily basis. And we don't even have a government. We don't have a federal government in the European Union. Uh, we don't have you know, the federal government of the United States. We don't have uh, the central government that China has or India has. Uh, we are you know, um, a kind of cartel of big business that is headless and policy-wise is absolutely incapable of responding quickly and swiftly to the challenges of the time. Well, let's shift a little bit to what you mentioned earlier, you know, this um, uh, tech, uh, let's say tech company, uh, for example, in the US and in China, you know, there's really tech giants. Uh, your new book, uh, Techno Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism, which is upcoming at the end of this September, in which you argue that capitalism today is being toppled by a new economic model, techno-feudalism. Tell us more about that. What is techno-feudalism? What's your worry? Let's begin by defining capitalism, right? Um, capitalism came after feudalism, as we know. Under feudalism, power, economic power and political power, came out of the land. The feudal lords owned the land, the peasants worked the land, the feudal lords stole most of the produce from the peasants and that access to the land which only the lords had gave them power. Under capitalism, the factor of production that gave power to the powerful was no longer land, it was machinery, it was capital. It was uh, you know, steam engines, today industrial robots producing commodities out of proletarian labor. So the two pillars of capitalism are profits, not rents, not like the feudal era where 
essentially rents were being extracted by the feudal lords. Under capitalism, it is profits extracted by the owners of machinery. And markets, the marketplace, whether it's a commodity market or indeed the labor market, where almost the whole of economic activity, production, distribution, uh, was taking place. That was what capitalism was. Today, if you enter Amazon.com, for instance, to buy something in the United States or in Europe, you are exiting capitalism because Amazon.com is not a market. It is like a feudal thief belonging to one man, Mr. Jeff Bezos, who charges a rent, I call it the cloud rent, to capitalists who are producing stuff, goods, and selling them through Amazon.com. He charges them 40%. This is a huge rent. I call it the cloud rent. And at the same time, it, since 2008, since the financial sector of the West collapsed, of the United States, primarily in the European Union, Central banks have been printing money to keep economic activity going. So in a sense, it's not profits, capitalist profits that are fueling and lubricating the capitalist system, the Western system. It is central bank money. So you've got the state producing the money, which is given primarily to people like Jeff Bezos to build up the cloud capital, which allows them to charge rents and essentially to exploit workers. Every, everybody who is using their tablet or their phone in order to create cloud capital for Google, for Netflix, for Spotify, and so on. And of course, proletarians who are working in the warehouses of Amazon, and they, are all, they all have a digital device strapped to their wrist, telling them what to do and speeding them up. So that system is no longer capitalism. That system is what I call techno-feudalism, and that has major repercussions for the instability of the West. Well, with that, uh, that's interesting. You know, you have a big tech, you have a cloud capital, and you have a geopolitical competition, or in your words, you know, I guess a lot of people would agree with you, the new Cold War launched by Washington against China. I wonder, you know, what's the repercussions in terms of this uh, relationship between China and the United States? Well, we have a new Cold War, and I very much fear that it may end up as a hot war because the United States is becoming increasingly aggressive and it is roping the European Union in. You know, when, when, when uh, Trump started the new Cold War against China, remember, he, it started with a ban on Huawei and ZD, uh, but then Biden turbocharged this new Cold War um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, when he, actually two years ago almost, uh, when essentially he banned the sale of advanced microchips to China. Uh, that was a message to Beijing. We're not going to stop you from becoming an advanced, technologically advanced economy. Every right-thinking person, every right, not, 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 as a, not as in right-wing, but correct thinking, correctly thinking person around the world, we must unite to end this new Cold War. And the only way of uniting it, uniting it is to effectively to create democratic movements in Europe, in the United States, that prevent the warmongers from turning uh, a very damaging new Cold War into a humanity-destroying hot war. Let's have a short break. We'll be back right after this. of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world. 
all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back. Speak of uniting against um, a new Cold War or even worse, a new hot war, uh, you know, from Washington to Beijing. Uh, Yanis, you know, where does European Union fit, uh, given them they have influence from Washington in terms of policy making, for example, uh, European uh, Union has a policy of de-risking from China. Uh, it's sort of, uh, let's say, um, uh, like, you know, like tilting toward Washington uh, in terms of their China policy. How far they will go? And, uh, you know, given what you said about, you know, our cheap gas or cheap energy from uh, Russia is gone. And, of course, there's a China market. Uh, I mean, can the European Union afford the loss of China market? It most certainly can't. But look, um, I am a staunch Europeanist. I'm an internationalist and I'm a proud European. But I have to tell you that I'm very ashamed of the European Union at the moment. You ask the question, what is the role of the European Union, you know, in this grand scheme of the new Cold War between the United States and China? The answer is zero. There's no role. We are irrelevant. Geostrategically, we have rendered ourselves as Europeans absolutely and utterly irrelevant. No one speaks for Europe at the moment, not Emmanuel Macron, because the Polish government and the Lithuanian government and the Estonian government cancel him every time he speaks. Uh, not Olaf Scholz. We have a president of the European Commission who has absolutely no democratic legitimacy. Nobody elected her, Mrs. von der Leyen. So the European Union, you, you, you refer to the de-risking policy of the European Union. It's not a policy of the European Union. It was dictated to us by Washington. And it's just a smart term for decoupling. It makes no difference whether you're talking about decoupling, de-risking, or participating in the new Cold War against China. Now, the, the, the tragedy of Europe, I mean, look, take an example recently, only a few days ago. Uh, European and particularly German manufacturers of uh, green technologies, of solar panels, in particular, but also batteries, issued a statement to the European Union, to the Commission, saying that uh, they cannot compete with Chinese imports of solar panels and, um, you know, especially, you know, battery technologies and electric cars. Well, that is correct. They cannot. And they're not going to, it's not that it is the Chinese fault. It is the Europeans' fault because for 13 years we've not been investing. So now we're not competitive. But what are they asking for? They are asking for some kind of Restriction of trade with China, slapping tariffs on Chinese in, in Chinese solar panels or batteries or electric cars. But that would be absolutely catastrophic for a German industry that depends on exporting to China. So I'm giving you this as an example of the fact that Europe um, simply is a figment of our imagination these, these days as a political entity. Uh, we're completely at a loss. We do not have any way of creating a sovereign European policy. We are dictated to by the United States, and we are caught up in this conundrum of the new Cold War between the United States and China. It is time for Europe to assert itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we're slightly moving on to uh, you know, a bit different topic here. We know this year also marks uh, the 10th anniversary of this Belt and Road Initiative from the Chinese side. And of course, uh, Greek is, uh, Greece is a part of, uh, uh, is one of the countries, you know, connected, uh, related to this Belt, BRI, in, uh, in, in the initiative of infrastructure. I wonder how do you characterize, you know, you, if you look back at the past 10 years of BRI uh, development in, um, in particular, developing countries building infrastructure. I mean, what do you say about this initiative? If you ask, officials in Brussels, they'll say, oh, you know, this is dangerous because the Chinese have entered through the back door, the Eastern European back door or the Greek back door. Uh, and they are 
sort of um, infecting the European Union with uh, policies that come from the Chinese Communist Party. Now, all this, of course, is absolutely rubbish. <laughs> because what all that has happened is this. The European Union has not invested. There's been almost no investment in my country uh, since the great financial collapse of 2008. No investment, no real, no, no investment in productive activities coming from Europe. Yeah. Even when they wanted to sell our ports, our trains, our um, whatever, huh? European companies came here simply to snatch assets in order to sell them again, but never to invest in them. It was only the Chinese who came here with some money. Uh, companies like Costco, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in the greater area of Italy, of uh, Eastern Europe. So the European Union has absolutely no right to um, uh, try to demonize uh, Chinese investment. When you have an investment vacuum, uh, just like nature hates a vacuum, <laughs> and something will fill it in, uh, Chinese money came here. The tragedy was that, and that comes from my own experience, I've written about it in books and articles, and I've spoken about it in other interviews. When I was finance minister of Greece, uh, I inherited a deal between the Greek government that was imposed upon us by the European Union, uh, a deal with Costco for the port of Piraeus, which was not a good deal. It was a deal that was uh, quasi-colonial against Greeks. But I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, when in my discussions and negotiations with the Chinese side, both the company, Costco, and the Chinese government, they were perfectly willing and ready to improve the terms for Greece. But who stopped that improved deal from uh, coming to fruition? Berlin. The German government stepped in and essentially told the Chinese government not to, com to proceed with an improved deal for Greece. So you will allow me to be very cynical. Uh, Chinese investments, not just in Greece, but in Africa and so on, they have their great advantages, they have some disadvantages, because whenever foreign money comes into a country, a country in particular that is under the thumb of its own oligarchy, uh, there can be colonial aspects to it. But nothing like what we've had in terms of colonial power and abuse and exploitation from our European masters and our American masters. Right. You uh, once said a few years back, you know, the Chinese approach uh, in commenting BRI uh, is far more humanistic than the United States, uh, you know, in the speech, I think, uh, in the lecture. And when the audience asks a question about, uh, you know, she's concerned about the Chinese building ports and roads in Africa or in other parts of the world. Uh, so, but what is behind the often you know, people would say, I found the concerns of China's Belt and Road Initiative here. Well, I insist that uh, there is no comparison between Chinese investment and um, American and European interference. Because let's, let's not forget that there has not been one regime that was overthrown by the Chinese secret services, whereas the CIA has been killing and, you know, uh, leaders, democratically elected leaders, uh, in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, uh, and then sending in its multinational companies to take over whole sectors of the economy, including its banks. That's imperialism. Uh, whatever criticisms we may have, and I have criticisms of Chinese investment. For instance, you know, I believe that um, Chinese loans to African countries in particular and impoverished countries must come with uh, provisions for debt relief uh, when those countries are suffering. There was an interesting um, case of such debt relief by Chinese banks that had lent to Zambia recently. I would like to see more of that Zambian approach by the Chinese lenders in the past, but there's no comparison. Uh, you know, the Americans and the Europeans went into Africa and effectively uh, ravaged the place, whereas China comes in and offers loans <laughs> or builds ports. <laughs> There's no comparison there. Now, clearly, the, 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 the very same interests from the United States and Europe that consider Africa and Asia to be their playground do not like to see the Chinese coming in and offering alternative ways of uh, uh, 
engaging economically with uh, the local societies. Um, it's, it's yet another example of how this new Cold War is uh, uh, playing out. Hmm. Uh, a separate but also a sort of related question, uh, Yanis, here is, you know, China has uh, set a goal of uh, achieving its, um, you know, Chinese modernization or modernization with Chinese characteristics. And uh, so what do you see are the challenges to achieve that kind of goal and why the stress of the Chineseness of the modernization? Well, if I were Chinese, I would be worried about um, decoupling from the United States. Uh, your economy must decouple from the United States because, in a sense, your savings, the profits that Chinese businesses make, you know, for decades now have been, as I said before, have been channeled back into the United States in the form of investments in American FIRE, F-I-R-E, standing for fi Finance, Insurance and Real Estate. Now, given the decision of policymakers, both of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, to persecute the new Cold War against China, this is not going to, to be replicated in the future. But the great query is this. The Chinese model of growth is based on, de depends entirely, so far, on the American trade deficit and the American dollar. Because aluminum produced in Shanghai or Shenzhen is channeled to the United States, paid for in American dollars, on the basis of the American trade deficit. The only way that your modernization process can continue and benefit the majority as part of your shared prosperity uh, project of the Chinese people is to reduce substantially the amount that you are investing in real estate in China to reduce substantially investment from 47% to 35% and to shift that part of your income to the working class of China, either directly through wage rises, but primarily indirectly through a proper provision of common goods from health, education, housing. That is the way that I would envisage a proper socialist modernization of China to proceed during the period of the new, new Cold War that Trump and Biden have, per have persecuted. With that, we come to the end for today's discussion. Many thanks to our guest, Yanis. You can also find us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.